Hello friends. Um, <clears throat> I've had numerous people reach out to me and ask me if I was going to record a video on any of the Isaiah chapters. And I was uh, thinking about that because I've written you know, a, several books where I talk you know, at length about the Isaiah chapters. My book, Delight and Plainness, addresses all of the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon. Um, and also, when you talk about Isaiah, it's really difficult to really explain what Isaiah is talking about without people thinking that you sound crazy. So, you know, as I've been thinking about, you know, should I record a Isaiah video, uh, I decided, obviously, that I should because I'm doing it uh, right now. But the subject matter that I chose, the chapters that I, you know, picked specifically to review uh, today are Isaiah chapters 52, 53, and 54. And the reason that I picked these specific chapters is because when Christ came to the Nephites, he had a special message that he said he was commanded by the Father to give to them. That message starts in uh, 3 Nephi 15, verse 10, through 3 Nephi 17, verse 4, and then picks up again in 3 Nephi chapter 20, verse 10. And in verse 10 of chapter 20, again he reiterates that, hey, now I am going to finish the message that the Father commanded me to give unto you. <clears throat> and he begins to expound upon the chapters, you know, these chapters in Isaiah. He quotes almost every verse uh, in these chapters. Uh, chapter 52, uh, he quotes almost every verse. Uh, chapter 54, he quotes every single verse. And uh, chapter 54, he summarizes in a very succinct way. So these are, are very important chapters. I mean, they were selected by God the Father for you to understand. And Christ himself expounds upon what these uh, verses mean. So I figured, hey, if I sound you know crazy when I'm talking about these chapters, at least you can go back to what Christ taught regarding these verses and know that I'm not making this stuff up. Um, so that's why I, I picked these specific uh, chapters to go over. Plus, you know, I think they're absolutely awesome in, in what they talk about. So let's let's kick off with Isaiah chapter 52, and I'm just gonna you know read you know through this verse by verse, and you'll give you my thoughts on what this means. So Isaiah 52 verse one, which Christ quotes in 3 Nephi chapter 20, verse 36. <clears throat> so, awake, awake and put on the strength, thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and unclean. So, what does this mean? Well, Fortunately, you don't have to take my word for what this means because in the Doctrine and Covenants, there's a question and answer section in section 113. And Elias Higby asks the Lord specifically what this verse means. And I'm very glad that uh, he did because you have a, a very reliable source, not just me as to its meaning. So I'm going to read from Doctrine and Covenants section 113 verses 7 and 8. Question by Elias Higby. What is meant by the commandment in Isaiah 52nd chapter 1st verse which saith put on thy strength O Zion and what people is Isaiah referencing to? Here's the answer. He had reference to those whom God should call in the last days, 
whom should hold the power of priesthood to bring again Zion and the redemption of Israel. And to put her strength on is to put on the authority of the priesthood, which she, Zion, has the right to by lineage, also to return that power which she has lost. Okay, so to put on thy strength means to put on the strength of the priesthood power, a strength that Zion has lost. So <clears throat> what are we talking about here? Um, well, let's look at what Zion was in the past. So the Lord defined a very certain people um, the city of Enoch and the people of Enoch as Zion in the past. And when you read the Dro Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 14, you learn that the people of Zion, Enoch's people, also Melchizedek's people who sought for and obtained the city of Enoch, meaning both groups of these people were removed from the face of the earth and taken elsewhere, somewhere in the universe. And these people had incredible power, a power that has been lost. Now, when you read in Joseph Smith's translation of Genesis 14, you learn that that power was to put at defiance armies and to change the course of rivers and to move mountains out of their place and basically to do anything that was needful to preserve Zion. Now, if the Lord is talking about this power being restored, then we should expect that for Zion when Zion is reestablished, restored, and there are many prophecies that the city of Enoch itself will be restored to the earth. But when we're talking, when the scriptures are talking about Zion in the last days, whereas the city of Enoch will be part of Zion, I mean, it is Zion now, it's mostly referring to the New Jerusalem, which will be an incredible sanctuary city. I mean, talk about sanctuary cities. The scriptures say that anywhere in the world, you know, those who do not wish to take up their sword to fight against their neighbor must flee into Zion. Zion, or the New Jerusalem, will be something else. And the reason that people can flee to Zion and be safe is because, according to the scriptures, the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, therefore we cannot stand. Now, when we're talking about terrible, we're not talking about morality, we're talking about priesthood power. The people in the New Jerusalem can kick our buns around our earlobes, in other words, <laughs> you know, is what, you know, all of the bad guys around the world are saying. Nephi saw something similar in 1st Nephi chapter 14 after he has this incredible vision of what's going to transpire in the last days. He sees that the wicked are going to wage a war against the Lamb of God and then he starts talking specifically about two groups of people the saints of God and the covenant people of the Lord. So when he's talking about the saints of God, he's talking, in my opinion, about the dis righteous disciples of Jesus Christ amongst whatever denomination they may be that have committed to the Lord not just in part, they're not doing the hokey pokey, sticking one toe in and one toe out. They have dedicated their life to serve the Lord. And 
know, these people are endowed with great power from on high, Nephi says. In fact, the specific words are that they are armed with this great power. Now, when you look up, you know, what the definition of armed is, it is, you know, used in conjunction with conflict, battle. So the city of Zion, the New Jerusalem, because <clears throat> at this point, I mean, the world is going to be helter-skelter everywhere, except for, you know, in Zion, in the New Jerusalem, the city of refuge, uh, which will be established in North America. And one of the reasons that it will be so secure is because of the priesthood power that will be exercised by its citizens, both male and female. And that power is stunningly awesome. In fact, regarding these days, you know, this is when you hear about the most impressive miracles that have ever taken place. In the history of the earth, you're talking about this time period, okay? So this is what verse 1 means. Now, going down at the end of verse 1, where it's talking specifically about Jerusalem. This isn't the new Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem over in Israel. So we are talking about the status of Jerusalem Post Isaiah chapter 4. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 4 and Isaiah chapter 3, in Isaiah chapter 3, we learn about how the daughters of Zion are, you know, I mean, they are severely rebuked because of their worldliness. You know, this, this ho hokey pokey thing, I mean, putting your, your right foot in to Babylon and then, you know, just sticking it, you know, hokey pokey style into, you know, the covenants of the Lord. But really, I mean, you're, you're following after Lot's wife and your, your heart is in the world and you're emulating the things of the world. And, you know, the daughters of Zion, you know, experience severe um, retribution as a result of that but not nearly as bad as the sons of Zion, who, you know, if the numbers in Isaiah chapter three and four are to be believed, when it says, I believe it's in the first verse of uh, chapter four, that seven women will cling unto one uh, man in that day, uh, begging that, uh, you know, the women can take the man's name to take away their reproach. The reason why it's seven to one says in earlier verses that the men are killed in mass. So, I mean, if you're talking seven to one, you're talking about 80% of the men are wiped out. <clears throat> So, and I mean, this isn't just Isaiah that's talking about this. In the Doctrine and Covenants, it talks about how in the last days, the whirlwind of the great and dread, uh, dreadful day of the Lord will begin at the Lord's house. First among those of you who have um, professed to know my name, but who have not known me and have blasphemed me in the midst of my house. What that means is that People, when you blaspheme the Lord um, by taking upon his name in vain, basically you're taking covenants which you do not intend to keep. So think of you know, the covenants that we, we make with the Lord. Upon baptism, we covenant that we will take his name upon us, that we will always remember him, that we will strive to have his spirit to be with us. In you know the temple, we covenant that we will obey him and that we will be willing to sacrifice um, whatever is needful uh, to further you know the work of 
salvation of the human family. <clears throat> we covenant that we will be chaste, that we will bridle our passions and keep them within the bounds that the Lord has, you know, set out for us. Um, you know, we, we covenant that we will, you know, live the law of consecration, that we will share our time and our talents uh, with, you know, those around us. Again, to further the work, you know, of the Lord. I mean, to, to blaspheme the Lord is to make these covenants and, you know, not really intend to keep them. And that's one of the reasons why the sons of Zion get their heads handed to them is because they make these covenants and, you know, they're at the forefront of, you know, some of the most despicable acts, you know, that, the, that Babylon has uh, to offer. I mean, you, if you look at most studies on pornography, you'll find that, unfortunately, uh, Utah leads the country in pornographic subscription rates per capita by heads and shoulders. That should not be the case. Um, we should be honoring our covenants and we should be involved in daily repentance and we should be turning uh, to the Lord. We should be, you know, committed more fully than you know, what Isaiah is suggesting. And, and in this first verse, after the purging and purification that is talked about in Isaiah's chapter three and four uh, happens, it says that everyone that is left amongst the living in Jerusalem will be holy. The same will be true for the new Jerusalem in, Amer in America. And no longer will the uh, unclean and uncircumcised of heart enter into those societies. They will be rock stars um, in their faithfulness and they will be enabled with tremendous power uh, and authority from God as a result of that. So this is what the first um, verse of Isaiah 52 means. And I better speed it up because I'll never get through these chapters. Okay, uh, Isaiah chap, uh, 52, verse 2. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. What this means is arise from the dust and sit down in the throne that the Lord has created for those that are covenant keepers, that honor the Lord. We are told in you know, the first several chapters of the book of Revelation that those that are faithful and endure the hardships of the world and overcome those through their faith in the Lamb of God will become pillars in the temple. They will receive a new name. They will receive pure white garments from the Lord. They will become kings and queens, priests and priestesses to the Most High God. Uh, and many other things, uh, many other promises, you know, are laid out there. That's what this is talking about. You know, in other words, snap out of it and rise to the full measure of your creation. And continuing, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Obviously, when it's talking about ye have sold yourselves, I mean, you've bought into the lies of the world, to Satan's distractions, his, his shiny, bright objects. That's, that's one of Satan's best tools, is just distracting the righteous with you know, all of the things that the world has to offer, whether that's shiny cars, bank accounts, you know, vacations, status, you know, popularity. There's, there's all kinds of different things that the world has um, to offer you. And so many people have traded what the Lord offers for what, you know, Satan and the world 
uh, is offering. And Isaiah is saying, don't do that. So, um, and then of course, you shall be redeemed without money, meaning the price for your redemption has been paid. Jesus Christ paid that for you. And all that he requires of you is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Uh, in other words, he wants you to place your will upon the altar of sacrifice and do the will of his father just as he did the will of his father. So moving on to verse four. For thus saith, uh, well, now those three verses, they're quoted verbatim in 1 Nephi chapter 20, verses 36 through 38. And then, interestingly enough, Christ skips over these next verses. These are some that he, um, I mean, they're the only verses in this chapter that he does not quote verbatim. And to me, that makes these verses as interesting um, as anything else. Why were they excluded? Now, when you look at what Christ taught the people, <clears throat> clearly there were things that he told Mormon, who was abridging the record, to leave out certain parts. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this is one of the parts that he told Mormon, eh, don't, don't include that part. And the reason that Christ told Mormon not to do that is because he said he wanted the people to receive the lesser portion of the word first to try their faith and that if they would study it as he commanded them to study in 3rd Nephi chapter 23 you know verse 1 and 2 um, then the greater things would be made manifest unto you through the power of the Holy Spirit and this is one of those so let's let's read um, chapter four through six, okay, or sorry, verses four through six. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now think about that. When Israel went into Egypt, were they oppressed by the Assyrian? No. They were oppressed by Pharaoh. Uh, Genesis says that uh, there aro arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. It was never the Assyrian. And this is very meaningful because throughout Isaiah, when you hear the phrase the Assyrian, it's referring to an incredibly powerful antichrist that will arise in the last days and oppress the Lord's covenant people. This is what this is talking about. The Assyrian will oppress the righteous without cause. Now, let me just give you an example of a couple other instances in the book of Isaiah where he uses the, the phrase the Assyrian in this regard. Now, th this may be a pretty long video. I, uh, I'm going to turn to Isaiah chapter 10. I'm going to read verses, I think these are 20, starting in verse 24. Yeah. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. Now, when we're talking about Zion in this instance, we're talking about both the New Jerusalem in America and the Jews in Jerusalem, Israel, because both of these people will be oppressed by the Assyrian in the last days. So Isaiah is saying, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, 
and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. In other words, when Israel was in Egypt, they were in complete bondage, servitude. That will happen again. The Lord's people will be completely overcome by this incredibly powerful Antichrist that will arise in the last days. And I'll read you a couple other uh, verses besides this one. But now in verse 25. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction, meaning the Assyrian and those who support them. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. What we're talking about here is when Gideon and his, you know, several hundred Israelites wiped out, I believe it was 80,000 Midianites um, in a miraculous fashion that never should have been possible. And so why this parallel is being made is the Assyrian in the last days will be removed from power in a miraculous manner that should not be possible, but it is. Now in verse 26, and the Lord, oh, that's what I just read. Um, and his rod, rod was upon the sea, and as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. So what he's talking about is as Israel was delivered from Pharaoh when the Lord divided the sea in half, an event that will rival that miracle will result, result in their deliverance in the last days. Now, verse 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. In other words, the reason that you guys will be preserved from the power, oppressive power of this Latter-day Antichrist will be because of your covenants and your fidelity to those covenants. You see, this Latter-day Antichrist will be so powerful that the entire world will be sifted into two camps. You will either be on the adversary side or you will be on the Lord's side. There will be no middle ground, no lukewarm people in those days. The divisive nature of this incredible man that is coming will not permit there to be lukewarm people. Everyone will decide. And if you choose the Lord, you will be preserved through miraculous means. This is why Isaiah said, the righteous need not fear, for they will be pres preserved even if it so be as by fire. Um, so this gets us through um, verse 4. Um, let me give you another example in Isaiah uh, when he talks about the Assyrian. Um, so this example is going to be from Isaiah chapter 14. And I think I'm in verse 25 and 26. So listen to this. that I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them and his burden depart from off of their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. So what he's talking about here, the Antichrist comes to his end and you can read about this in Revelation chapter 19. When he's kicked out of America, 
he goes and he besieges the Jews in Jerusalem, all Israel, and the Jews kind of fall back to their keep, which is Jerusalem. And there, they are besieged for three and a half years, and they're preserved through miraculous means. Uh, in other chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah is talking to the, Jew, the Jews in Jerusalem, and he says, listen, all thy leaders are gone. All, all thy sons have failed thee. You've got nobody. But these two shall come to thee. Meaning, two, two prophets, two powerful prophets, as spoken of in Revelation, will come to Israel in the last days, and it says that they will be full as with fury and, and that they will run through the streets of Jerusalem as wild bulls. And nothing will be able to stop you know, these two prophets um, for three and a half years. And then finally, at the end of three and a half years, because of the Antichrist and who he is, and according to Daniel, um, chapter 11, the devices that he is able to forecast against the nations, he ultimately overcomes these two prophets and kills them and leaves their bodies lying in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. And then after three and a half days, the Lord comes and calls those two prophets uh, up into the sky and they stand upon their feet in the eyes of all nations and they go up into heaven and then according to Revelation chapter 19 the Lord comes down from heaven with the armies that used to be in heaven meaning there were armies that in heaven that came to the earth and now they're here with the Lord too and when the Lord comes they're his backup but he doesn't need them as backup he wipes out the entire opposition. I mean, this is the battle of Gog and Magog, spoken of in, of, in Ezekiel. <clears throat> Gog and Magog are the same thing as this Antichrist and what John the Revelator refers to as the beast. Um, <clears throat> the image of the beast that is you know, given life and um, forces every man, woman, and child on the earth to worship him or be killed <clears throat> and not be able to participate in the economy. I mean, these are, these are the circumstances of this Antichrist and this, this beast. And um, so Christ comes, and according to Revelation 19, he casts both the Antichrist and the beast into a lake of fire while they are yet alive. And then just with the word of his mouth, um, according to Zechariah, he utters a curse which causes all the wicked that remain upon the earth, not just the armies of Gog and Magog, but everywhere. And Isaiah talks about this curse as well that wipes the, the wicked from off the face of the earth everywhere that they are at. Um, and according to Zechariah, you know, their eyes are consumed in their sockets, their tongues are consumed in their mouths, you know, their flesh is consumed while they stand upon their feet. I mean, this is Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, the wicked are gone in an instant suddenly. And we learn, you know, from Ezekiel that it takes a very long time for Israel to bury their dead and seven years for them to burn, you know, the weapons of war, you know, so <clears throat> that's what we're talking about um, right here in Isaiah, when the Lord is going to break the Assyrian upon his mountains. Again, going back to Zechariah, the Lord, when he comes, he divides the Mount of Olives in half and the Jews are able to make their escape and then the Lord fights their battles and breaks the Assyrian upon the mountains of Judah. <clears throat> so, you know, that's, that's what that uh, means. But, you know, I realize that these things are, they sound unbelievable. Um, they sound crazy. And 
just hearing about them makes people not want to listen anymore. So let me just give you one more example that this is in fact what um, Isaiah is talking about. And this is going to be from the book of Revelation, um, chapter 13. Let's see. Revelation 13. I think, for the, I think I want. Yeah. I'm going to start in verse 5. And there was given unto the beast a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue for 40 and two months. This is the, you know, when it says power was given unto him to continue, he was already wreaking havoc on the earth, but he gets his buns kicked in America because of the establishment of Zion, the new Jerusalem. And then he goes and he besieges Israel for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwelt upon the earth shall worship him. Okay, so this is the Antichrist and the beast. Again, I mean, these things sound like they're crazy because they are crazy. But this is what's going to happen. And this is why the Lord commands us to study Isaiah because so many of us are not ready for what's going to take place on the earth. We have no box for this. And I envision that when these things actually transpire, there are going to be millions <clears throat> of LDS people that are going to be angry <clears throat> at other people, that they will push the responsibility for having needed to teach them these things. They're not going to take responsibility for listening to and obeying Jesus Christ when he said, listen, I, he expounds on all these verses and then he says, listen, I give you a commandment to study these things. But we don't. We expect other people to, to teach us these things. And I expect that when these things start to happen, people are going to abandon their faith in droves because they didn't see it coming. It wasn't on their radar. And they're going to say, well, pff, if the brethren didn't t tell me about this, it was because they didn't know. Um, and so it's all fake. <clears throat> Not, I mean, throwing aside the fact that in the Book of Mormon, you have numerous examples of people who begin to expound upon these things and were told, no. You're not going to expound upon these things beyond, you know, what I have put in here. Is that other people have written about these things and they will expound upon those. One of those was Isaiah. Another one of those was John the Revelator. So if we don't study these things, is it the prophet's fault? I mean, the prophet has asked us to make a study of the covenants and promises that the Lord has made with the house of Israel and told us that we would be astounded if we did. Now, if you really want to study and understand Isaiah, Nephi tells us there, there's basically, Isaiah is basically encrypted. And he tells us if you want to decrypt Isaiah, you need to have two ciphers. He says, first you need to have the spirit of prophecy and that sounds like a pretty tall order. I mean, to understand Isaiah, all you need to do is have the spirit of prophecy. Well, great. Um, but John the Revelator explains, remember, he was one of those who was meant to explain these things to us. He expounded that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what Nephi was talking about if you really want to understand the words of Isaiah, 
you need to understand Jesus Christ. You need to understand who Jesus Christ was before he was born upon this earth, who he was when he was born upon this earth, the covenants that he made with the people upon this earth, and what he has covenanted that he will do yet again in the future. If you understand those things, that's the first part of the cipher. The second part of the cipher, according to Nephi, is, and I believe this is in uh, 2 Nephi chapter 21, if you want to go and you read it yourself. He says that nobody on the earth understands Isaiah likened to the Jews. In other words, if you want to understand Isaiah, you need to understand how the Jews were thinking. And the Jews, one thing that they got right, even though they didn't follow through, they, un they had the understanding and the knowledge that life was about their covenants. And they saw the world through the perspective of their covenants. Would to God that they would have kept those covenants, but you know, they, they, that's how they understood the world. They knew the covenants that the Lord had made with them and all of the promises associated with that. And we have forgotten those. We think about the Abrahamic covenant but there are more covenants with Israel than the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is kind of an umbrella covenant. But one of the most important covenants the Lord gave to the house of Israel is in their total and complete restoration upon the earth. And they will be as if they had never been scattered in the first place. Now think about that. The Jews are currently the only nation on the planet that identifies explicitly with Israel. Now, I think there's an argument that the United States, that many people in the United States, and perhaps even a majority, certainly not everyone, also feel that this country is affiliated with the house of Israel and specifically with Joseph. And it is no coincidence that you know, when you go to Federal Hall, if you ever do go to Federal Hall, which is where George Washington, um, the Bible that George Washington uh, was sworn in when he was uh, inaugurated on, is on display. <clears throat> you can see the page where George Washington placed his hand. And he placed his hand uh, on Genesis uh, chapter 49. Specifically, when you, when you look at that Bible, uh, the left page is, it's a graphic. And the right page is, you know, Jacob's blessing to Joseph. Uh, specifically, he says that Joseph is a, a fruitful bough by a well that groweth over the wall, and that the archers hated him and fought against him, but the strength of the Lord was with him and preserved him against his enemies. And this is talking about the foundation of America, um, uh, especially since this is coming right on the hills of George Washington's victory over the most powerful nation on earth you know, at this time. So um, that's, a, that's a very important piece of this to understand the covenants and to decrypt Isaiah. You need to be able to understand the life and mission of Jesus Christ and the covenants and promises pertaining to the house of Israel. And when you understand all of those different events, as you go through and you start reading Isaiah, and you read a passage and you say, now, which of those events can I liken this to? And then Isaiah will begin to make more sense to you. <clears throat> so now let's continue um, in 
the next two, only two verses in this chapter that Christ did not quote verbatim. And this is again in verse 5, talking about the Assyrian that is oppressing the Israelites. Now therefore, what have I here said, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over, over them make them to howl, saith the Lord. And my name is continually every, or my name continually every day is blasphemed. Remember, this Assyrian, this Antichrist, speaks marvelous blasphemies against the Most High God. This is what Isaiah is talking about. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. In other words, the world will be sifted in that day. And those that choose to follow me in the face of everything else, they will know me. Everyone else, they won't. So now we get back to um, verses that Jesus Christ uh, cites verbatim. He's, this next verse, verse 7, Jesus Christ cites in uh, 2 Nephi 20, verse 40. And this is the context of it, you know, this Antichrist. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring good tidings, that publish peace, that bring good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. You know, in other words, how blessed are those that will teach Israel to have hope despite the oppression of the Assyrian that's coming. And to understand these covenants and to have the fortitude and the foresight to cling to them, regardless of what the Antichrist is able to say or do. And then uh, these next uh, verses, he cites in 3 Nephi 16, verses 18 through 20. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Now, in this particular part of Christ's message to the Nephites, specifically in chapters 15 and 16, the context of this is Christ talking about, hey, I have other sheep that were not of the fold of Jerusalem. And I told the Jews that, and they didn't understand and they didn't ask anything. So the father told me, don't tell them anything more about it. But now I'm over here in America and I'm talking to you guys. And he specifically says that ye are a remnant of the house of Joseph. <clears throat> and then he tells them that I have other tribes which are not of this fold, nor of the Jews in Jerusalem, nor of any of those lands anywhere remotely by those guys. And the Father has commanded me to go and talk to them as well. And again, uh, Jesus Christ highlights that fact in 3 Nephi chapter 17, verse 4, where he says, listen, you guys, go and study these things. Go home and pray to the Father for strength to understand what I'm talking about. And while you do that, I'm going to go and minister to the lost tribes of Israel, for they're not lost unto the Father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. So this is the context of this verse when he says, Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, together they shall see eye to eye. Who are they seeing eye to eye with? They're seeing eye to eye with the other watchmen of the other groups of Israel. Now, when the Lord is talking to the Nephites, his message is very clearly uh, broken up into three different parts of Israel. The lost tribes of Israel, Joseph in America, and the Jews in Jerusalem. Those three groups. Those same three groups are the three graftings that are spoken of in Jacob chapter 5. 
Um, <clears throat> so what the Lord is talking about is that the watchmen of these three different groups will finally see eye to eye in that day. This is, we're talking about Doctrine and Covenants section 133 verse 26 here. When it says that they of the north countries will return when their prophets no longer stay themselves. In other words, when the prophets of the lost tribes of Israel say, okay, it's time for us to come back. And then it goes on to say that when they come back, the enemies of Israel will be a prey to them and that the mountains of the everlasting hills will tremble of their presence. And, you know, that um, the highways or, you know, the, the mountain peaks will be a highway to them and that, you know, the Lord will bring forth springs in the barren wilderness. <clears throat> and that the lost ten tribes of Israel will come to the Lord's servants, the children of Ephraim, and fall down at their feet and be crowned by Ephraim uh, amongst the everlasting, everlasting hills. This is saying that the lost ten tribes of Israel have their own watchmen. And the day will come when they will come return to the earth in mass. And in that day, this passage will be fulfilled. And you know, I'm reading these specifically from Isaiah. I encourage you to go and read the context of Christ's message, you know, when he's talking about these things, because the context that he has is about, listen, Gentiles in America, when the lost tribes of Israel, referred to as the remnant of Jacob, return to you, if you are not keeping your covenants, they are going to wipe you out. Your cities will become desolate. That is what um, he is saying. Now, um, let's continue with verses 9. Uh, Break forth into joy. Sing, uh, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. This is talking about, you know, Jerusalem, after the three and a half year reign of the Antichrist, will be desolate. I mean, the cities of Israel will be wiped out. Jerusalem, two-thirds, according to the prophecies of Zechariah, two-thirds of the Jews will be wiped out. There will be a third that will remain. And of that third, every single one that will be left is going to be righteous. But what the Lord is you know, saying here is that the desolate places will be re-inhabited. And they're going to be re-inhabited by the lost tribes of Israel who will repopulate the lands of their forefathers. And in other, elsewhere in Isaiah, um, Isaiah says, can a nation be born in a single day? Yet in a single day, the lands of Israel will be overflown with Israelites. And these coming Israelites will say, make space for us. You know, this place is too straight. There's no place for us. Uh, we need more, you know, lands of inheritance. And these people will inherit the earth. The righteous will inherit the earth because the wicked in every city uh, across the globe will have been wiped out, as uh, discussed earlier. <clears throat> then in verse 10, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. In other words, you know, when the watchmen of Israel, all three groups, Joseph in America, the Jews, see eye to eye with each other, they recognize each other for who they are, and also this returning remnant of Jacob, um, the lost tribes of Israel, that will result in the most tremendous manifestation of the Lord's power in the eyes of all nations that has ever been displayed in the history of planet Earth. So, I mean, these things 
are incredible. So now uh, going into verse uh, 11, which uh, Christ quotes in 2 Nephi chapter 20, verse 41. Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Again, this is talking about, you know, what Joshua was talking to about Israel. How long will you be of two minds? Either the God of Israel is God, and if he is, worship him. Otherwise, just go after the, you know, the Canaanites. But don't continue doing the hokey pokey. Pick a side. That's what this verse is talking about. If you are going to be a covenant person, then be clean. Now verse 12. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you. And the God of Israel will be your rearward. Now what this is talking about is after the new Jerusalem is established in America. And Christ explicitly says that it will be the remnant of Jacob that will make that happen in America. And that they will invite anyone else who wants to, to help them with that. Now, Ether 13, verse 3, Ether saw that the new Jerusalem was descending out of heaven to America. And in fact, uh, John the Revelator saw the same thing in Revelation 21. So out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, here's two witnesses. Here's uh, another witness that this is the case. Uh, Revelations 21. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new Jerusalem is already built. And it's a city that exists amongst the lost tribes of Israel. And it's coming down largely complete. Now, we're talking about the city center coming down. The new Jerusalem according to the dimensions that John gives us in the book of Revelation, will essentially be the entire continent of North America. <clears throat> so it will be huge. So when we're talking about rebuilding the, the build-out of the New Jerusalem, we're talking about the rebuilding of North America, but the New Jerusalem is coming down from heaven. And when we rebuild the New Jerusalem, it is going to be not like any city that we know here upon earth because you know the lost tribes of Israel um, are going to have technologies that are far beyond anything that we can imagine um, and you know this this gets to the part where I begin to sound like I'm crazy so uh, I just want um, to explain this in the most succinct way that I know how. And the most succinct way that I know how is just to read a verse um, out of the Pearl of Great Price where the Lord, this is, when I'm talking about the Lord here, this is literally God the Father saying this. And he says this to Enoch. And he's talking about the New Jerusalem. Um, listen to this. I shall prepare an holy city that my people may gird up their loins and be, be looking forth for the time of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. Now listen to what he says about the New Jerusalem in verse 64 of Moses chapter 7. And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. How many creations has the Lord made? Earlier in the same chapter, Enoch 
tells the Lord, if you could take this earth and break it down to its particles and number those particles and a million other earths like it, it would not be the beginning of the number of thy creations. So we are talking about something marvelous, incredible, beyond description taking place during the millennium when civilizations from every world, inhabited world, that the Lord has made across the universe, across the multiverse, will come to the new Jerusalem because it will be the galactic capital. And the Lord will be there. That's why people are coming from all over the universe. So when we are talking about all those who will come to help rebuild North America, North America will be rebuilt in incredible ways. The millennium is going to be much cooler than you think. So that's what it's talking about. Um, now, that takes place in America, but what about the righteous throughout all the rest of the world? Particularly when the Antichrist is still wreaking havoc for three and a half years. Um, and remember, the beast is going to be killing those that will not worship him. And so the righteous need to be gathered in. And they need to be gathered in in a miraculous manner. And that's what this verse is saying, that the Lord will be their rearward. Now, when you're talking about the rearward of an army, you're talking about the folks that are going to take the brunt of protecting the main body. <clears throat> and the Lord is saying, I'm you know, that force. And particularly, he's talking about you know, preparations that he has made to make this happen. And it is the lost tribes of Israel. And specifically, um, as we learn in the Re uh, book of Revelation, the 144,000 uh, um, that will be called forth uh, primarily from the lost tribes of Israel, because there will be um, 10,000 from each tribe, um, or 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, and, you know, we really only have, you know, numbers to pull 10,000 from of uh, Judah and Joseph today. So these 144,000, according to the book of Revelation, they're going to be incredible. It says that they're the first fruits unto God, meaning these people are, are probably not normal. Um, they're not going to be able to be killed. They're... Um, in my opinion, they're resurrected. Uh, and they're, they're probably righteous beings from former generations um, because in the book of Revelation, it says that they're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ both night and day. They never leave his side. Um, and it also says that these were called and chosen in the sixth, the sixth seal. Uh, and I think that they've already you know, been identified. <clears throat> um, but the reason that they need to be incredible like this is because they are going to go out into the world. I mean, this is spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 16. Uh, Jeremiah says, listen, first I'm going to send forth fishers and they're going to fish for Israel. But afterwards, I'm going to send forth hunters and they're going to hunt for them. And he also, in the context of that, he says, listen, in that day, you're no longer going to talk about, you know, the God of Israel who divided the Red Sea. You're going to talk about the God of Israel who restored Israel from the, from the lands of the north. In other words, the restoration of the lost tribes of Israel. This is, this is what is meant by the 10th article of faith when it says we believe in the literal gathering of Israel, which is what we're doing now, and the restoration of the lost tribes of Israel. That restoration will be this miraculous event that transpires. Um, and the 144,000 that go forth into every country on the planet and bring in the righteous to Zion, that's what this verse is talking about. <clears throat> now, um, verses 13 through verse uh, 15, these are very interesting uh, verses because the Lord is talking about this servant that's going to do these things. Um, and he refers to this servant in a very 
uh, interesting and unique way. And again, the Lord um, quotes these specific verses in um, 3rd Nephi chapter 20, verses 41 through 45. And he says this, <clears throat> Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Now, this is Jesus Christ talking. It's not really Isaiah. And many were astonished, meaning astonished, at this servant. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations. What's he talking about? That the Lord's servant will be marred more than any other man on the, the planet. <clears throat> and that he will sprinkle many nations. Well, what we're talking about, his servant, is Israel. And he is marred more than any other man because of what happens to Israel. I mean, Israel was once the most powerful nation on earth. Every nation on earth brought, during the, the days of uh, King um, Solomon, everyone acknowledged Israel as the people of the Lord, and they all brought tribute to Solomon. And, <clears throat> but since then, you know, they, they broke their covenants and they were scattered to the point that they weren't even a people. Um, and that hasn't happened to any other group of people that still exist as a people. And Israel will be complete, completely restored as if they had never been cast off at all. That's why it's talking about they have been marred more than any other man. It's not talking about Jesus Christ, who the next chapter, chapter 53, is all about the suffering servant. and talks about Jesus Christ bearing the stripes um, of everyone, that everyone might be healed through his stripes. But we, the, the suffering and excoriation of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion are very well documented. And the fact of the matter is, is what made Christ's suffering unique was not the physical torture aspect. That had literally happened to thousands of other men. The uniqueness of this is the fact that this happened to Israel and it has never happened to another body of people like Israel. And that's what it means that you know, he shall sprinkle many nations with Israel. Though Israel was once a nation in, in uh, its own nation, after Solomon, it was divided into two nations. And then one by one, those nations were dissolved. And the lost ten tribes were removed as a body. And the Jews were scattered to the uh, four corners of the earth. <clears throat> So that's what it's talking about. Um, and then it goes on to say in verse 15, the kings shall shut their mouths at him, meaning at Israel, for that which they had not been told shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. This is going back to when the arm of the Lord is revealed in all nations. I mean, when Israel is finally restored upon the earth, people are going to be shocked by what has transpired. It will be something that they have never even heard or considered of. We're talking about the restoration of Israel. And to prove this point home, let's just go to Christ's commentary. The verse immediately after um, he quotes this is... Uh, 3rd Nephi chapter 20 verse 46 um, and this is what Christ says 
<clears throat> verily, verily, I say unto you, all these things shall surely come, even as the Father hath commanded me, meaning he commanded me to share this verse of this chapter of Isaiah with you. Then shall this covenant, which the Father hath covenanted with his people, be fulfilled. And then shall Jerusalem be inhabited again with my people. He's talking about the restoration of Israel. And it shall be the land of their inheritance. Okay? So Christ gives the meaning for the marred servant as being Israel itself. Now, you know, there's many people who have taken all kinds of different meanings to the marred servant. So I want to just drive this point home because in the writings of Isaiah, Israel is referred to as the Lord's servant numerous times, you know, more times than I have time, you know, to go through and talk about. But I'll just give you three examples, you know, and I want you to pay attention to these examples um, because I, I believe that they are very insightful to us. So the first example <clears throat> I'm going to give is from Isaiah chapter 44. Okay, and this is verse 21. <clears throat> Remember these. You know, the, these is talking about more than one. Now listen to this. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel. Now this is interesting. Jacob and Israel are the same person. <laughs> Jacob's name was changed after he wrestled the angel of the Lord all night long and would not let go of him until he promised to make the blessings that uh, the angel of the Lord had promised Abraham, Jacob's blessings. And it was only after that that the angel of the Lord who I believe hands down was Jehovah, then changes Jacob's name to Israel. So the meaning here is, remember these, O Jacob and Israel, means the reason why it's saying Jacob and Israel is because the Lord is identifying here two different groups. The Jacob's, of the world, those that, you know, are descendants of Abraham, but have not wrestled with the Lord to make the covenants their own. So they're Jacob's. Those people that have had that wrestle with the Lord and have obtained these covenants for themselves, they are Israel's. So that's what it's referring to, okay? Remember these, O Jacob, and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. Now remember, at the end of Jacob's life, he recalled this experience of wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And one of the things that he said was that the angel of the Lord blotted out his transgressions. <clears throat> um, thy, uh, in other words, I have blotted out thy transgressions as a cloud. Thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So... Clearly here, the Lord is saying, Israel, you are my servant. Now, I really like um, this next verse here. Sing, O heavens. So why do the heavens sing at the redemption of Israel? Think about that. When the Lord is talking about the heavens singing, he's talking about 
all of those inhabited worlds singing. He's not talking about, you know, planets devoid of life singing. He's talking about the focus of the family business. And what is the family business? The work and the glory of God is to bring to pass the immortality and the eternal life of man. He's talking about those people singing at the redemption of Israel, rejoicing at the redemption of Israel. That is a very important thing to the heavens. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forests, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Again, the two, when the Lord uses these two names, he does so with a very specific purpose. He's redeemed Jacob. He's redeemed, you know, the descendants of Israel. Of, he's redeemed the descendants of Abraham. But he glorifies himself in Israel, meaning he glorifies himself. In fact, elsewhere in the scriptures, we learn that Israel is the inheritance of of Jehovah. Um, he's glorified in Israel. In other words, the Lord's glory comes from the covenant keeping portion of Jacob. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. There are two people that are talked about from the womb. You're you know, Christ was talked about from the womb of his virgin mother in Isaiah. And then Israel is talked about from the womb as being you know, the Lord's people. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. And I love this part. That frustrateth the tokens of the liars. In other words, I'm the Lord and I overturn the works of darkness. I overturn the works of the secret combinations. And perform the, um, oh, sorry, and maketh diviners mad. Um, those that try to, you know, forecast the future of the earth. I mean, think, the, think of the, the elitists, the globalists that want to form the earth to their own, um, image you know, they have all of their own prophecies about how in the future we will uh, you know own nothing and we will love it well you know here the lord is saying listen i make those kinds of diviners mad because that the future belongs to me not to them that turneth the wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolishness in other words you know, the wisdom of the wise is going to seem foolish, utter foolishness when the Lord's covenants are fulfilled in the last days. So I said, I, I, I'm reading these passages from Isaiah, Isaiah uh, 44. It, they all relate to the fact that Isaiah is the Lord's servant. Now, uh, another example of this comes from Isaiah 41. I really like this uh, you know, example as well. This is Isaiah 41, verse 8. <clears throat> but thou, Israel, meaning the covenant people, thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth. Meaning, the Lord has literal, literally removed a portion of Israel from the ends of the earth. Um, now, the last example of, of Israel being the Lord's servant comes from um, verse 3 of Isaiah 49. <clears throat> Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. You know, this is, again, 
a reference that the Lord's, the glorification, at least in the Lord's opinion, his glorification is going to come in the magnification of the righteous of Israel in the last days. So, I mean, this is, a, this is incredible stuff to me. And if you read you know, more the context of all of these things, you, you'll read the context, it's miraculous. Um, so that, that gets us through Isaiah chapter 52. Now, Isaiah chapter 53, I'm not going to read this one because this one is, is very well known. This is the suffering servant chapter. Um, and Isaiah, or Jesus Christ, he, in my opinion, chapters 52, 53, and 54 are all part of the same revelation. Um, but Christ skipped the center part. <clears throat> and... He, he summarizes that whole section with just one part of his discourse to the Nephites where he says, listen, the day will come that if the Gentiles in America will reject me, Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, then I will send the remnant of Jacob amongst you as a lion and they will devour you and make your cities desolate. So Isaiah chapter 53 identifies Jesus Christ as the Savior, the God of Israel. And you know, there is a part in this chapter where it says, who will declare um, his generation? Meaning, who will, who will the Lord's seed be? Meaning since he was cut off from the earth prematurely um, and ha does not have you know, off offspring otherwise. And it goes on in that chapter to say, well, the offspring um, of the Lord are those that will accept his sacrifice mm -hmm. and apply his atonement in their lives. That brings us to Isaiah 54. Now, every single verse of Isaiah 54, uh, Jesus Christ cited from memory, verbatim, in 2 Nephi chapter 22. So I'm going to go through these, and I think that this chapter will make a lot uh, more sense you know, given the you know, other chapter that you know, we've already read. Uh, Isaiah 54, verse 1. Seeing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. What is this talking about? <clears throat> this is talking about the fact that... Joseph and Judah are in large part, you know, desolate, meaning, unfortunately, the majority of their, of those that, uh, you know, follow Joseph or affiliate themselves with, with Judah or Judah, you know, are not really, um, true disciples of the Lord. I mean, they're, they may be, um, let's, how do you say this? Uh, followers of the Lord through the traditions and customs of their fathers. They have not paid the price to learn of the Lord and to wrestle with the Lord as Jacob did and to make the covenants of Abraham their own. Um, and as the, and as a result of that, you know, they're, they're going to be purged and purified of all of those that, you know, are just, um, the, their faith is, you know, not very deep. <clears throat> just like, you know, the Jews who claimed to worship Jesus Christ, but then when Christ came, you know, they didn't know him 
um, because theirs was uh, a faith of tradition, rather, for the most part, of you know heartfelt discipleship. Now, about two percent of the Jews did go on to follow you know Jesus Christ, but the majority of them did not, and that's what this is saying. That you know, in the last days, you know, the barren of yeah, the, the covenant people are going to be barren, meaning they don't have as many children as they should. But the Lord is going to bring children, covenant children from elsewhere to repopulate their lands. And that the children of the desolate will be more than uh, the children of the married wife. Meaning that in the last days, the dominant population upon the earth will be Israelites. And most of those Israelites are going to be coming from elsewhere. Now verse 2 in uh, verse 54. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand, and on the left hand, thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Now, when you read Christ's Neph message to the Nephites, he talks about how the, the remnant of Jacob is going to go forth and make their cities desolate. But their cities will be inhabited by Israelites, covenanted people of the Lord. I mean, essentially, we're saying the same thing happened that happened that is testified of in the Book of Mormon so many times. The Jaredites, this was their land of inheritance until they went back on the covenants that they had made with the Lord, and then they were wiped off the face of the planet. And then this was the covenant land of Joseph until they turned their backs on the Lord and they were wiped off. What the Lord is saying again is those that you know, are, are not, have not paid the price to make these covenants with the Lord, they're, they're going to be wiped off and the covenant people of the Lord will inherit the desolate places of the Gentiles. Now, uh, picking up again in verse 4. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither shalt thou be confounded, for thou shalt not, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shall not remember the approach of thy widowhood anymore. Meaning Israel has a history of being doofuses. You know, the, now let, let's go to Revelations chapter 12. Revelations chapter 12 is very interesting because in that it's talking about a woman and the woman is clearly the house of Israel. It is the church is a subset of the house of Israel. The woman, or the house of Israel, gives birth to this man-child who is destined to rule the nations. The church did not give birth to Jesus Christ. Israel did, okay? So this woman represents Israel. And in Revelation chapter 12, the woman is given the wings of a great eagle to flee from the face of the, the, the dragon who is trying to destroy Israel. Because in this chapter, it talks all about the war in heaven and how Satan was cast down to this earth and that Israel was, or the dragon, Satan, was wroth with Israel. Because Israel had a, in the pre-mortal realms, uh, Israel had a tremendous role to play in, Kate, in Satan losing that war in heaven and being cast out and banished with a third of the host of heaven to this earth. In, in other words, he's imprisoned here. And it is not coincidence that Israel was sent to Satan's prison planet to live out their mortality. And, you know, Revelation 12 says that the, the dragon is wroth with Israel and seeks to destroy her and is very effective. I mean, you look at what happened to the northern 
a kingdom of Israel and to the kingdom of Judah and to uh, the Nephites. I mean, they were wiped out. But the, that revelation specifically says that the main body of the Israelites were given wings of a great eagle and were removed from before the face of the dragon. And what I believe this to mean is that there is a, the largest body of Israel was removed from the earth. And I believe that this is consistent with what uh, Jacob chapter 5 talks about. It talks about the first, the second, and the last graftings. And that those graftings, you know, are referred to as the first shall be last and the last shall be first, meaning that the first graft that was made, which was the lost tribes of Israel, will be the last graft that will be restored. <clears throat> and when you read about that first grafting in Jacob chapter 5, it talks about it in two graftings. The first of which was made in the worst part of the vineyard. And the vineyard represents the earth. So the first grafting took place in the worst place on planet earth. And then the second subset of this first group was grafted into a place that's even worse than the first. And the only place that you can have a place that is worse than the worst place on earth is if it is not on the earth. And again, that's talking about uh, uh, the largest portion of the house of Israel was removed from the earth. And I mean, you can go read Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 4. It talks about you know, how there is a portion of Israel that will be uh, restored from uh, the ends of heaven. Nehemiah chapter 1, I want to say verse 7 says the same thing. You know, Christ said that the elect would be gathered from one end of heaven uh, to the other. I mean, all of these things point uh, to this you know, being the case. So this is what we're talking about. Israel will be restored and the desolate places on the earth, the cities that were destroyed because of the, the wicked that occupied them initially will now be inhabited by the covenant people that are restored to the earth in the last days. Um, and that Israel will no longer remember the doofusness of their uh, forefathers because they will be valiant and righteous in their covenants ever after. Um, and in verse 6, For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, a wife of youth, when thou was refused, saith, the, saith thy God. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies I will gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee, for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on thee saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. For this as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. In other words, this is all talking about, hey, once the great and dreadful day of the Lord is over, and the earth has been uh, purged by fire, just like the earth was purged by the waters of Noah and are, yeah, by the waters of Noah. Um, that kind of purging will not happen anymore. And you will be righteous ever after, you know, these events. And then in verse 10, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. So, I mean, what this is talking about, for the mountains to depart, I mean, that is going to take, eventually, through the erosion of time, the mountains will be made smooth. But the Lord's kindness, and that will take millions of years to, to happen, billions of years, but the Lord's kindness will remain with Israel you know, forever and ever. Now in verse 
11. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of agate, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. This is again referring to the establishment of the New Jerusalem upon the American continent. John the Revelator refers to the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem being of precious stones, and that the walls of the New Jerusalem are 12 layers of you know, semi-precious gems, um, and that all the gates, there are 12 gates to the New Jerusalem, are made of precious things. This is you know, in reference to that. The Lord will make your lands of inheritance uh, in, in exalted places. I mean, the city streets of the New Jerusalem are made of pure gold, according to John in the book of Revelations. <clears throat> so now returning to verse 13 in Isaiah 54. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Meaning, you know, the structure that we are used to and that was really brought to pass because of the obstinance of Israel <clears throat> um, will not exist anymore. There will not be this layered hierarchy where the Lord speaks to a prophet and then they speak to, you know, other leaders and they, you know, speak to the other leaders and it trickles down to us. Um, it'll be a one-to-one -one, um, relationship where the Lord teaches our children and we learn from you know, the Lord directly. I mean, this is straight out of Jeremiah 31, 31, um, when the Lord says that he will make a new covenant um, and that you know, the covenant will be that you know, men will no longer teach their neighbor, saying, know ye the Lord, but all men will know me um, from the greatest to the least of them because God will be with us and amongst us and we will be his people and we will, we will be part of his household. We will no longer be taught by other people. We will be taught by the Lord. Um, so that is a, you know, a marvelous promise. And then in verse, uh, verses 14 and 15, in righteousness shall thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. Thou shalt not fear and, and from terror for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against, against thee shall fall for thy sake. You know, in other words, I mean, people will gather against Israel, but they won't stand a chance. I mean, when you really study the book of Revelation, you learn you know, people talk about, you know, the great dreadful day being the end of the earth. It's not. Uh, it's the beginning of... Well, it's the purification of the earth so that the millennium can transpire. But after the millennium, Satan is loosed again. And interestingly enough, uh, it says that in both Isaiah and John, um, in the book of Revelations, it says that there will be another war where Satan will rally the wicked once more and that the hosts of heaven will come to war against the new Jerusalem. And it says that the Lord doesn't gather these, the wicked across the universe to come to war against the new Jerusalem. They do that of their own accord, but they don't have a chance. <laughs> it's it, in the book of Revelations, it says that they come to besiege the new Jerusalem. And I can't think of a more, you know, ridiculous strategy than to think that you can besiege the city where the Lord is and win. Uh, so this is what the Lord is talking about here. Yeah, you know, they are going to fall, you know, for thy sake. And then verse 16 and 17 have reference to the miraculous manner uh, in which the Lord will deliver the earth in the last days. And, you know, after the siege of the new Jerusalem after the uh, millennium in verses 16 and 17. 
Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. I have created the waster to destroy. He's talking about the remnant of Jacob. Um, Jeremiah refers to Israel uh, as Israel, thou art my battle axe, and with thee I will thrash the nations. Um, this is this remnant of Jacob that Christ throughout his discourse to the Nephites refers to as a lion who will come and destroy the wicked on planet earth in the last days. And in verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee, against this remnant of Jacob, shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. This is, this is how the Lord ends his, Jesus Christ ends his sermon to the Nephites and then commands them in verse 23, uh, or chapter 23, verse 1, to start studying the words of Isaiah. He commands them. First he says, ye ought to uh, study these things. And then he says, no, a commandment I give you that ye search these things. So friends, you know, this has been you know, a long video. Yeah, I just, you know, when I, I wanted to show you these verse by verse chapters that according to Jesus Christ, God the Father commanded him to share. So, yeah, I'm sharing them with you. And I hope that you understood what I was talking about. I hope that you want to make a study of, you know, the words of Isaiah. I mean, I have, I have, I use, I go through all of the Isaiah chapters verse by verse in my book, Delight and Plainness, which is being translated into Spanish, uh, should be available in a couple of weeks, which I'm really uh, excited about. I, I served my mission in, in Chile and uh, I'm excited to be able to, to share you know, these things with my you know, brothers and sisters uh, in South America. Um, and also my book, uh, A Remnant Shall Return, I go into the Isaiah, I have a whole section on you know, Isaiah. If you want to understand Isaiah better, you can do those things that I talked about earlier that will help to decrypt you know, Isaiah's words, or you can use my books that are really you know, like study guides. But uh, I hope that you will appreciate the words of Isaiah. Isaiah is one of my heroes. He, he has done so much for us if we will seek the Spirit of the Lord to be able to understand you know, those words. The day will come according to the prophecies within the writings of Isaiah himself that the Gentiles will rise up and call him blessed. I certainly bless his name. And you know, I, I hope that you will too. Uh, until next time, friends, you know, God bless.